Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Max, and today I'm going to talk about why we think that you should stop trying to glue your services together and import lymph instead. Um, who are we? To get that out of the way first, we're Delivery Hero. We're a online food ordering service holding. Uh, so what online food ordering is all about is basically the concept is simple. You, I'm, I guess that there's no one around who's really unfamiliar with it. Uh, you get hungry and you go online to one of our web pages. You search for restaurants that deliver to where you are. You compile your order, you pay online, and then you wait for the food to be delivered. So basically, it's like e-commerce, but with grumpy customers by definition. And the, also, the fulfillment part is interesting because food needs to be delivered quickly. That's something you need to take into account. We're operating in 34 countries, and we're headquartered in Berlin. This is our mascot, the hero, therefore delivery hero. So just a quick show of hands, who of you attended the talk by Matt about Namiko before lunch? That's a fairly good amount because there are a few things that we're not going to talk about but which Matt nicely introduced. So we're not going to talk about what services really are or as, or as opposed to monoliths or why you should do go with the service-oriented approach, uh, where you should not do it, how this helps you. Um, neither are we going to talk about cloud stuff or Docker or why you should call it microservices and not microservices or what, how micro is micro. But what we're going to talk about is Lymph today. So Lymph is a framework for writing Python services. And to start with, uh, I'd like to justify a little why we wrote another framework, because usually developers say like, hey, there's something out there already. In this case, there wasn't. Uh, so once we have that out of the way, we're going to get our hands dirty uh, with a live demo, fingers crossed that that works all right. And that's basically the main section of this talk. And afterwards, we're, we're briefly looking under the hood of Lymph, what other features are there, which we don't touch today. Uh, briefly touch on things like Namiko and so on give you a little outlook, and then hopefully there's time for a Q&A in the end. So uh, I have to be fair and say, if you want to go over things in your own time, then there's this entire introduction. Uh, you can find an article at import minus lymph.link. Everything is written down there. You can go over things in your own time. With even, there's even more detail. You will find the exact same examples or, or uh, services that we're talking about today. You can try things for yourself. There's a vagrant box set up that you can use, um, which we'll use later, or just to debrief yourself on what we talked about today. So why do we write another framework? That's pretty simple. Two years ago, roughly, we've been to the situation where we said, we want services in Python and not worry. So, Let's assume that our decision to go with services was right. We were running with a big Django monolith, basically a lot of spaghetti code of the legacy variety, the one that no one really likes. So therefore, the idea of going with services became increasingly attractive to us. And we wanted to stick with Python, because usually you say, hey, if you do services, the idea is that you don't have to worry which language you're going to run with. But as, we're, as we like to do Python, every developer should be able to be as productive as they are. And if we would not have stuck with Python, well, then I couldn't be here today and, and, and talk about it. So that's good. And we didn't want to worry. We didn't want to worry. That means if you want to run your services and, and do services, there was nothing really that was helping you a lot back then. So we wanted services in Python and not worry. The first two things are easily ticked off. The third one wasn't, and therefore we came up with Lymph. So we had certain expectations, though. Running and testing your services should be as easy as possible. You should not have to worry about glue. That means, I, as an author or operator of a service, you should not have to worry about how to register your service, how to run it, how to configure it. You should not have to worry about any of these glue code at all. Configuration should be simple and flexible. You should get a lot out of your configuration files without having to write a lot of code to pass them and deal with them. Possibly you should take the same 
servers, run it on your local machine, your lab environment, staging live, uh, possibly another country even, simply by configuring, configuring it differently. Scaling naturally should be easy, so uh, if you need more resources, then you just throw more instances into your cluster, yet the client code should be totally unaware of this. Uh, we wanted to have the opportunity or the possibility to speak RPC rather than via HTTP interfaces be able to do to emit events so that we can do asynchronous communication. But we also wanted to easily integrate or expose HTTP APIs. And last but not least, if you want to introduce a new service, then there should be as little boilerplate as possible. Yet a fair amount of scaffolding helps you to nicely structure your stuff. So what we came up with was Lymph. Uh, you can find Lymph at Lymph.io, and we think that it, or the idea is that it should satisfy all of these requirements. So I repeat myself here, I think it's a framework for Python services, and by default, Lymph depends on RabbitMQ as an event system and Zookeeper for service registry. So just one more quick show of hands, who, who knows what RabbitMQ is? Good. Zookeeper? Ah, fair enough. So Zookeeper is a distributed key value store. And that's how we do service registry. But you'll, we'll find about that later. So here comes the scary part. Uh, so people say that I should not animate my slides. I should not show code on slides. Um, and neither should you ever, ever, ever do a live demo because it will hor go horribly wrong. Uh, so I'm doing I'm going to show you code, and it's animated, and we're going to do a live demo, so uh, there's nothing that could possibly go wrong. So to begin with, and to jump into the thick of it, we're going to write services, and we're going to ex increasingly introduce new services to see how they interact with, with each other. We're going to run them. We're going to play around with them to explore the tooling that Lymph brings with itself. So, And we start with the most sophisticated Hello World example you could think of that's a greeting service and it's funny because Matt used basically the same example that was not that was not planned but it's funny though um, so this greeting service you you give it a name and what it's supposed to do it's supposed to return a greeting for for that name so to begin with we need two files sorry uh, that's the first line already we need two files we need the implementation of our service naturally in a py file and we need a configuration file in a yml file Sorry, that's YAML. So to begin with, for our service, we start with importing lymph, and this is basically where this talk lives up to its, its, its claim. Uh, we import lymph, and we want to define a service called greeting, and we do so by inheriting from lymph interface. And like I said, we want to expose one method as its interface. It's called greet, takes a name, and we can expose it easily by decorating it with lymph RPC. And then what we do inside of this method is we simply print the name which we received, saying hi to. We are emitting an event to let the world know that we're just greeted someone. And lastly, we're, we're returning this, this greeting. The configuration file is rather straightforward as well. We have to tell Lymph which interfaces to run and where they are located on the Python path, because what Lymph does is that it imports it at runtime to bring up an instance of this service. So, Let's get our hands dirty, and we'll do this within a prepared Vagrant box, which is readily accessible for everyone at import minus lymph.link. It provisions via Ansible, and what, you ha what this Vagrant box does is it has Zookeeper and RabbitMQ running inside, and uh, to, easily, to make things even more accessible, there are prepared TMUX sessions, which you can easily fire up, which then start services and panels and which are nicely labeled using the toilet command. And this is what we're going to do now. So let's go there and run our services and play around with it. You don't see the topmost line of my shell, which is confusing, but you should see everything from now on. So this is where in the box now it greets us very friendly with import lymph. And there is this tmux session prepared. And we're fired up with mux start greeting. And what you see now is two panels. One is running an instance of the greeting service. On the right-hand side, you can see that we are running lymph instance, and we need to point it to the configuration file so lymph knows 
which interface to run. On the left-hand side, we simply have a, have a shell, and this is where we'll explore the tooling that lymph, that lymph comes with. So to begin with, let's say we don't know anything about lymph at all, so it should tell us about the commands that are available. Lymph list does so. That's a whole lot amount of text. Don't worry, you don't have to read them one by one. We'll, we'll explore things bit by bit. So let's say we have no clue whether there are any services running at all or which there are. Lymph discover should tell us so we can discover services and indeed it tells us there's one instance of the greeting service running as expected. Let's continue to play dump and say we don't know anything about this service. I want to get to know something about its interface. So lymph inspect greeting should inform us about this services interface. And this is more than expected actually. So the topmost function that you see Sorry, the topmost uh, method, that's the greeting method, the one we've just implemented ourselves. And below that, you see four built-in methods which you get by inheriting from lymph interface. So let's exercise this, uh, the service. We can do so by issuing lymph request greeting. Greet will supply the Request body that needs to be valid JSON, talking and typing at the same time is hard. And I'll greet you guys, the EuroPython. So what we'll expect to happen now is the request should hit the instance of the greeting service. It's supposed to print something and we should re receive the, the uh, greeting in the response. So fingers crossed this works and it did. On the right hand side you see that it said saying hi to EuroPython and we received the response on our end as expected. That's very nice. On to the next service. So uh, yeah, this is what we just did. So the greeting service is also emitting events every time we're greeting someone. This is something we haven't seen yet. And it's emitting events, there's no service that consumes them, so let's write a service that consumes these events. And as creative as we are, we're going to call it listen service. And once more, we need two files, one where we implement the service and one where we configure it. So we start with importing lymph and we define the service by subclassing lymph interface. We're calling it listen. And like I said, every time an event of type greeted occurs, we want to consume it and we want this method to be invoked exactly invoked, sorry. It's called onGreeted and it receives the event that has been emitted. And all it does is that it takes the name from the event body and it prints that somebody greeted that name. The configuration is just as straightforward as before. We have to tell lymph that it's supposed to run one interface, the listen interface, and we have to point it to where this is located on the Python path so that they can be imported. So let's run them in combination to see how they interact. Therefore, I'm firing up the Tmux session for that. And we're doing a leap of faith here. We're not only running one instance of each service, but in this case, we're running two instances of the greeting service and one of the listen service. Let's assure ourselves whether they have registered correctly with our service registry. Lymph discover should tell us. So as you can see, indeed, there are two instances of the greeting service and one of the listen service. So the listen service is supposed to consume certain events. Let's assert whether that really is the case. So we can event, uh, sorry, emit an event of type greeted with lymph and we have to provide a body also, once more, needs to be JSON, and the name is EuroPython. So what we're expecting to see now is once we emit it, the listen instance is supposed to consume it, and it needs to print something. In fact, it consumed the, you can see this down here, it consumed the event that was emitted before when, I, when we re were requesting the uh, greeting instance. So we, we're expecting to see it print again now. Very nice, it printed as expected. So let's request a greeting and see whether they're correctly working together. So 
So we're expecting to see now, to, once we send this request, we expect it to be handled by one of the greeting instances. It should print, should return to us, and the listen service should print once more. And in fact, the, the second greeting instance handled it. Now, if we repeatedly issue this request, the request should be <coughs> randomly distributed over the greeting instances. And fingers crossed, yes, this worked. Topmost one handled it, and the other one, very good. So this seems to work as expected. But it wouldn't be 2015 if we were not talking about web services. So let's expose our the functionality that we have within our service cluster, which is the uh, bleeding edge greeting service, and we want to expose it via an HTTP interface. What we need to do there is we're going to write a web service. And once more, we start out by implementing it in Python and configuring it afterwards. So in this case, we import from Lymph web Serv interfaces the web service interface, and we'll also need some Vaxog tooling to deal with URL mappings, and, and since we, we also want to return a valid response. Business as usual, we define our web service by inheriting from web service interface. We want to expose one URL, which is slash greet, supposed to be handled by the greet method, which uses the request, and we expect the name to be in the query string. And what we do there is when we receive the request, we pick the name from the query string, we print that we're about to greet someone, we're invoking the greet method of one of the greeting instances, this is RPC basically, <coughs> sorry, and then in the end, we're returning the, the greeting in the response. And we also need to configure it. And as our web service is supposed to listen to a port, we have to include this in the, in the configuration. That's the only bit that differs from the two configuration files we've looked at before. So let's run everything together. So what we see here is one instance of each service running, web, greeting, and listen. And since all tablets die hard, let's make sure that they have all registered correctly. Lymph discover should tell us. And indeed, there's one instance of each service. Let's exercise the web service now and see whether they are actually working in combination as they should. So we're listening to port 4080, and the name should, should be in the query string, that's Europython once more. So once we issue this request, we expect to receive the greeting in the, in the response, and all services, sorry, all instances should print something in order to validate that they were actually being spoken to. So let's issue this request. And in fact, all services, all instances printed something, and we received the greeting in the response, says, Hi, Europython, over here. Uh, but there's one thing that you might see already is the, the, the more services you run, the more complicated it becomes to, well, develop with them locally. You need more shells to run the instances, and if you want to run several instances of one service, you will need to run them in several shells. That's becoming rather painful, and it has become rather painful here already because we want to run three services. We need three shells. That's a bit of a pain. But there is lymph to the rescue. It comes with its own development server. It's the lymph node command. And what we need to do to get its leverage is within the directory where we want to run our development server, we have to, we, there needs to be a configuration file called .lymphyml. And in there, we configure the services that we want to run, and we configure how many instances of each so this is highlighting the, the important sections. So if you want to configure instances, you basically tell Lymph how to bring up that, that instance and how often. So we run two web service instances, three greeting service instances, and four instances of the listen service. And within the last section, since we have two instances of our web service running and they're listening to a port, we have to c configure this one as a shared socket. So let's bring up our node. 
you won't only see the node on the top right panel, but below that you also see tail. With the lymph tail, you can subscribe to all the logs of any service. So in this case, we subscribe to the web greeting and listen service, and it will print all log statements that it receives from the, from the instances. So let's make sure that everything registered correctly because there's no output in the lymph node window, uh, sorry, panel. Lymph discover should tell us that we have indeed two, three, and four instances of the services running respectively. And let's hit our service cluster as before with at localhost, let's greet, name goes into the query string, once more, Euro Python. And what we expect to happen is once we issue this request, it should be handled by the instances. We should see print, three print statements now in sequence in the node panel, and below that, plenty of, of um, log outputs. So fingers crossed this works. Very nice, it did. So you see three print statements up here, almost reads like a little haiku, about to greet EuroPython, saying hi to EuroPython, somebody greeted EuroPython. The response looks good as well. We can see the, the greeting has been returned as expected, and we see plenty of almost confusing log output below here. But now consider that possibly your instances might be distributed over any number of machines. And if you want to debug something or, or follow the logs and get information from that, it's hard to tell which log statements belong to each other. How can I relate them to, the, to a request? Possibly they, well, belong to the same request, but the log statements come from several different machines. Lymph lets you overcome this problem with the trace ID. So whenever a request enters the, the cluster and it does not have a trace ID assigned yet, lymph assigns a trace ID to the request and this trace ID is being handed forward via every RPC request and event that is being emitted. And then whenever we log, it's being logged with it. So you can see here, we hit the web service and it returned a header called X trace ID and that's where it included the, the trace ID. And let me allow to use uh, I terms search highlight, no sorry, search and highlight function. So you can see the trace ID is appearing in the logs properly and within your own time, maybe you can assure yourself that it actually logs correctly with the trace ID and we can correlate all the log statements via the trace ID. That's very good. I managed to successfully go through the demo part and nothing broke. So let's just briefly reason about the communication patterns which we've just observed and th I think I went a little bit too far with animating stuff but maybe that's, hopefully it's entertaining. So we started with having two, three and four instances of these service running respectively and we issued an HTTP request it was handled by one of our web instances. It printed something, and then we wanted to invoke the greet method via RPC of one of the greeting services. So what happens behind the scenes is that we consult our service registry, which is Zookeeper by default, and we ask it for all the instances of the greeting service, and then we pick one at random to send the requested, and in this case, it was the lowest one, the request is being sent over, it printed something, emitted the event to our event system, which is RabbitMQ by default, returned the response, and then we had nice output on the shell, and on a possibly entirely different, entirely different timeline, one of the listen instances consumed the event by getting it from the queue, and printed, naturally. So we see there's, there's RPC, available, which follows the request reply pattern, and it's synchronous communication, and we are also emitting events, that's the pub sub pattern, and 
that's asynchronous communication. Uh, so you've seen, I've, I've jumped slides here already. Um, exactly one instance of all the listen services will consume the, the event. However, there are situations where you'd like to inform every instance of a service that something occurred, and all we need to do is, on the lower left, you can see that we decorate the service, uh, sorry, the, the method which is supposed to consume the event as usual, but we say that it's broadcast, and what happens instead is that we, when we emit the event, we're publishing to three, uh, sorry, to four queues in this case, and then it's being consumed four times, and that, as a repercussion, naturally, we would have seen for print statements. So these are the, the communication patterns which are available with LIMP. So, but what else does LIMP come shipped with? So what's in the box is that, what I mentioned already, LIMP manages your configuration files. You can get a lot out of your configuration with very little code. Uh, it provides a testing framework so that you can unit test your, your services following the fashion of, if I invoke this RPC method, is an event being emitted as expected, um, or run some together and exercise them. Uh, its dependencies are basically pluggable, so you could exchange Zookeeper for something else, you could do service registry with something else, you could not use RabbitMQ, but something else like Kafka, for instance. There are service hooks, so when, you, when your service starts, you want to possibly set the stage for it, like you want to provision a database connection, and then once you shut it down, it's supposed to be cleaned up. There are service hooks for this. Uh, LIMP allows you to do futures, so usually classic RPC is, is blocking, and, but possibly you're not interested in the, in the reply from the service, or, or you're interested in later, so you can do this with a future, you can defer the call. LIMP collects a good amount of metrics when it runs your service already, and then it exposes them, but you can also collect custom metrics. So for instance, if your service is talking to a third party API and every now and then this request times out and you want to keep track of how often this happens, this is what you can easily do. Um, you can also write your own plugins for LIMP. There are even more hooks that you can plug into and get custom code executed whenever something interesting happens. Uh, out of the box, there is a new relic and a sentry plugin for LIMP. Uh, it's easily, the, uh, sorry, the CLI interface is easily extendable. A colleague of ours wrote LIMP top, which is basically like top, but for LIMP services. And you can handle, you can receive remote errors, you can get shells on remote services, and so on. There's a whole lot more. So how LIMP works under the hood is that anything that is supposed to be sent over the wire is being serialized with message pack. Message pack is, well, that's their claim, like JSON, but a little smaller and a little faster. Um, RPC is being dealt with with zero MQ. Like I said, service registry by default happens with via Zookeeper, and the events are being the event system is RabbitMQ. Every LIMP instance or every service instance is a Python process, and it handles requests and events within greenlets. And this is what we do with Gevent. And everything that is web or HTTP, uh, we use Vector tooling for that. So, since some of you attended the Namiku talk already, as for things that are out there that are similar to what LIMP is, there's one thing that needs to be mentioned, of course, that, that's, that's Namiku. Namiku does a lot of things very, very similar, almost startlingly similar to how LIMP does things. Naturally, it does certain things differently, uh, but it's, it's very nice. And if you haven't attended the talk, I suggest that you have a look at Namiku. Also, there are other things out there which, which don't solve the, the big picture, like Namiko or LIMP tried to solve it, but they, they supply solutions for, for niche problems, like zero RPC or other stuff. And you would still have to provide a good amount of glue code yourself, and this is what Namiko and LIMP both try to avoid. So what we have in mind for the future of LIMP is that we want to have this little ecosystem of libraries for writing special purpose services easily. So there's, we, we have LIMP storage in mind, LIMP monitor, which then collects all the metrics from other services and stores them wherever, or does with them whatever you want. Uh, LIMP flow, which is basically, the idea is to 
write business processing engines which deal with your business process and manage your entities and whatever there is that is to come. So to sum things up, if you can remember this one thing that LIMP is a framework for writing services in Python, I think I have been successful today. You can find out more at LIMP.io and naturally it's open source. Your contribution is very welcome. You can find the, the docs at read the docs. Everything is linked there at limp.io. Uh, like I said, this introduction, it's all written down in more detail following the same narrative as today at import minus limp.link. That's where you find all the examples. That's where the vagrant box is. That's basically where you can go and play around with, with uh, limp. And last but not least, if, if, if you're a Spanish speaker and you'd like to hear this talk again later this week in Spanish, then my colleague Castillo will give the same talk in Spanish. Uh, in Spanish, it's, I, I had to learn this by heart, it's Deja de pegarte con tus servicios, import lymph. I don't know whether I made a good effort, but I see you're nodding, very good, so that worked. Um, and here comes the shameless plug that goes with every talk. So we're, we're hiring. If you're interested in working with us in Berlin and you want to work with, with Lymph, if you find that interesting, um, you possibly have seen this flyer in your attendee back already, feel free to reach out on, at deliveryhero.com or f see us at our table in the hall. We've brought goodies and gummy bears, most importantly. Thank you. And thanks to the organizers, of course. <laughs> Questions? There are some. Oh. Or maybe you can just shout, and then I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear. Or you would just like this. Your first question, well, theoretically, it's possible to talk to LIMP services, but you would do, have to do it yourself. So you would have to basically re-implement the, exactly within any other language. And your last question, I didn't get it. So your question was whether you can uh, use LIMP node the, yeah, it's the the idea behind lymph node is to be used in development. It's not the idea is not to replace your production. How to how you should run it in production? The idea is to help you run stuff locally. Ah, yes, you can you can spawn anything with a lymph node. Basically, you just supply a command. I don't know, for instance, to run your Redis server, you could include it there as well, and then it runs it for you. Hi. Uh, just to correct, uh, what versions of uh, Python do you support? And uh, if you support Python 3, why didn't you use uh, uh, something like uh, IO, HTTP, or modern things in place of work? So to answer your question, yes, both Python 2 and 3 are supported. I don't know with which Python 3 version it starts. I know that we have a li had a little trouble with this in the past, but it's supposed to, we're supposed to support Python 3 as well. And I didn't, uh, your other question, IO, HTTP, I don't know about that, but to preclude your, uh, your question already. But other, yeah, sorry. Uh, so about message versioning. Do you support that or that's something somebody will have to do on top of your uh, message Message versioning? Yeah, for example, if you run two different versions of a service in a cluster. You, 
want to, so you're running two different versions of a service and there's nothing that deals with it out of the box right now. You would have to deal with it yourself, I guess. I mean, it depends on whether the interface is backwards compatible, but there's, you can't, it, it should, would be another service then. If you want to run two different versions, right now you would have to run two different services or just ex expand the interface. Yes. Uh, thank you for a great presentation and uh, it worked out. It's amazing to see such a polished software, uh, which, which promise uh, a lot. Uh, but uh, what's on your um, in your backlog? Uh, what's what's the issues you're working on? What's your roadmap uh, for uh, developing it further? So the the idea is to further let these special purpose libraries. I'd like to call them that to let them further mature and and then release them as open source at some point. Um, but right now, the idea is to simply make Blimp more stable. I mean, we, we're going to run it in production anyway, so this is something that will naturally, and that will naturally grow and mature within the future. Hi, uh, I don't know if I got it right, but uh, I understood that you're using uh, Zero MQ for the RPC, handling the RPC calls and RabbitMQ for handling the events. Yes. Have you considered perhaps uh, uh, using RabbitMQ for both and then getting rid of one extra dependency or did you experiment that didn't work or? Yeah, so for instance, Namiko uses, uses uh, RPC, goes via ZeroMQ, sorry, via RabbitMQ there as well. Um, for us, it was a design decision not to, to do RPC over, over something persistent as RabbitMQ. Actually, my question was going the other way around. If it is also possible to replace RabbitMQ with a zero MQ for the pub, pub sub. Uh, yeah, definitely. So, so is it, but you said it is pluggable, but is it already implemented or is it something I would So I was care? expecting your question, and therefore I prepared something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, this is the part of the .lib YML, which I actually didn't want to show because it's a little confusing. However, what you can see here is, um, this is actually where things are pluggable. So you could provide another class which does registry or handles events. This is what it looks like by default, but you could provide your own backends for either. And I see everyone's eyes narrow, so yes, it is confusing. And just one more quick question. Um, I've seen in the YAML files that were, uh, at least maybe in the simple examples, just names of uh, services and uh, class path. So wouldn't it, would it be possible already just to have a decorator that defines the name and then just launch it with like getting rid of the YAML file and just launch the instance just providing the path to the class? Um, well, in theory, yes, that's possible. But the, the idea behind this is that you could group several interfaces together and run them as one service. Um, and I think this is just more flexible. Because then you don't start to mix what's in your configuration, what's not. This way you have everything in your configuration and that's where it is. Thank you. Cheers. Nice. Cool. Thanks, guys.